We're reading from Luke chapter 2. The angels had returned to heaven, and the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us all about. And so they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angels had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all that, that they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Just what to do I bowed down and worshipped the life and the truth The way in a manger is a babe fast asleep He's never a stranger to wise men who see the light and the hope for all of mankind. He's the way in a manger, and he's easy to find. The light and the hope for all of mankind is away in a manger and he's easy to find is away in a manger and he's easy to find Great light shines best in great darkness. That is a lesson we learned as we traveled many miles in the darkness of night. And I know, I know, 
Nighttime is the most dangerous time to travel. However, there's a great degree of difficulty in following a star in the daylight. <laughs> uh, we were looking for royalty, but we had no idea what we were going to find. Eh? I've been in the outer courts of princes and kings, noisy assemblages these, hangers on on every corner, quarters of favor, making endless rackets, scheming, chattering, everyone wanting an audience with nobility. And none of that here. No, no, no. Here, silence. Lingering, calm, awestruck silence. Here, a newborn, wrapped in cloths and lying in a feeding trough. There were two milk goats standing silently behind him. Chickens pecked on the ground. An exhausted woman and a humble man. And outside, shepherds. Shepherds timidly watching, and all are silent. We dare not say a word. We bow down. We worship. And we gently lay our gifts on the ground. I've spent the bulk of my days searching for the truth of it all, trying to make sense of this life. But that search, it was different. That time, while we were searching, we were also being led, not, not merely by a star, but by the hand of Almighty God. He led us. He led us to the one in whom all truth rests. He led us to a child, a baby, a king. Sometimes when I get a chance to come up and talk, I like to try to reach uh, people's hearts and in a sense talk about the love of God and paint a picture of that and, and let the beauty of God's love compel us towards him. Other times, uh, I try to poke your brain a little bit and um, to connect the dots and, and, and not so much fall in love with Jesus, but to think and understand, grab hold of the truth. And that's what we've done for the last four weeks in Advent building up to this. We've looked at more of the head part, trying to grasp truth, grasp facts, understand, connect the dots. And, and I think some have had some really cool aha moments as we've traveled through this. So I want to do um, a little bit tonight and see how all of this fits together. Because the first week of Advent, we lit the candle of hope that's over here. And we worked our way through a number of statements made about Jesus from hundreds of years before he was born. As the prophet spoke and gave us details of his life and his birth and his death um, and, and painted a picture of the Savior that these people were waiting for, that first candle was all about in a dark and broken and hurting world, Jesus brought hope. That was that first candle, the candle of hope. The next one, the second week, we looked at love. And we lit the candle of love. We talked about uh, that, that day, we talked about it from Mary's perspective, as the bride in this story. And in the middle of a long process of an ancient Hebrew uh, wedding that it took sometimes up to a year. And we talked a little bit about that process. All of it generated from love. 
And, and the, 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 the parallels between the ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony and what Christ did in his coming and in his death and even until today, the parallels of that are incredible. As, as, um, as quick a thumbnail sketch as I can give you, the father, the groom's father, sends him to the bride's house. He stays there for a while. They build relationship. During that time, he, he comes up, they, they write a covenant and sign it. He pays the payment, and then he announces he's going back to his father's house to prepare a place for her, and he's there until the father says. And when the father says it's time, then he comes back and sweeps his bride away, uh, and they spend seven days together, and then a wedding feast. And it, that's about as slim a description as, of, of that as that I can give you, but every detail, even down to the, to the sentences they would say to each other, are precise in, in the life of Jesus and what he did, as, as he is described as the bridegroom and his church is the bride. Why? All of that because of love. So we lit the second candle that was love. Then the third week we talked about peace, and we looked at the shepherds. And if you can picture them out in the fields that night outside Bethlehem in the quiet and in the calm, a very peaceful night, loudly and boldly interrupted by the angels. And instantly, the first emotion, the first feeling, the first thing is fear. These non-human messengers are right with them. And they're afraid. It's chaotic. There's confusion. There's bewilderment. Bewilderness. Did I say fear? And the first words out of the angel's mouth is, do not fear. Isn't it strange that in the chaos, in the darkness, and in the fear, was the message of peace? And, and that's what we talked about that morning. Because all of us live in brokenness and darkness and fear and in chaos to some degree in our lives. And Jesus doesn't necessarily come and erase that. But he comes and brings us peace in the middle of that, real concrete peace in the middle of that. And so we lit that third candle representing Jesus uh, and peace. And let me just take a sidetrack here for a second. This week, I learned something new. And one of you shared a video with me uh, that was teaching from a rabbi in Bethlehem. His name was Rabbi Jason Sobel. And I guess if you try to find me in the next week or so, I can probably point you to this video. But if you picture these shepherds in the fields right outside Bethlehem, as, as they ran into town to find this baby, I, knew, I think they knew exactly where they were going. I don't think they had to search around, and I don't think the angels coming to them was nearly as random as it might seem. Here's what this rabbi talked about on this video. He says they're out in their fields, and they're just outside Bethlehem. And because they're at Bethlehem, meant something. They weren't just normal, everyday shepherds. Because they were at Bethlehem, they would have been Levitical shepherds or the priestly shepherds. And their role would be to raise the sheep that would be sacrificed in the temple in Jerusalem. All of those sheep for the sacrifice, for the cleansing and washing away of their sin, for their forgiveness for their sin, all of those sheep were born and bred in Bethlehem. And that's who these shepherds would be raising. And so um, the, the location of that is important. When it was time for lambs to be born, these shepherds would bring their sheep into Bethlehem, into what's called the shepherd's caves. Now we sing about a manger in a stable, and, and we've only learned that from the songs because the Bible doesn't say anything about a stable. It was probably, if we listen to the rabbis and the historians, it was probably a cave. And if you went to Bethlehem today, you could go and visit the shepherd's caves. That was where the lambs for the sacrifice were born. And here's one of the most interesting bits of this. That once those lambs were born, they were immediately swaddled in cloth. And that's significant because these lambs had to be without blemish. They had to be pure and, and without any mark. And so as soon as they were born, they were wrapped and swaddled. So when the angels came to the shepherds that night and said, The Savior has been born, and you'll find him in a manger, and he will be in swaddled cloths, 
they would have known exactly where to run. You can imagine these shepherds. When the angel said, go and you're going to find a baby in the place where the sacrificial lambs are all born. A person who the prophets called the Messiah, the Lamb of God, who would take away the sin of the world, born in the same place where the sheep who were bred to do that. A person who would be perfect and blameless, swaddled just as these lambs were so that they would be spotless. A person who would become the sacrifice once and for all for the sin of the people. You don't think these shepherds knew exactly where to go to find this baby? And I don't think it's very random that the angels came specifically to them. But for the shepherds on that night, in a moment of fear and confusion and chaos and maybe scrambling around, quickly turned into still and calm and quiet. And so we lit the candle of peace. And then just a couple of days ago on Sunday, we talked about joy. We looked at Joseph and the joy that a father experiences with her newborn, holding his precious newborn. And after weeks of an emotional roller coaster for Joseph, and the heartache, and the anger, and the sleepless nights, now, now there was overwhelming joy. And it's still that true today. In the middle of who knows what, in the middle of life, he is where the joy is. And we lit the fourth candle representing joy. So that brings us to tonight. And I'm going to light the fifth candle in a second here. The fifth candle is the center of this matrix. It's the culmination of all four, the coming together of all four of those. The last candle represents Jesus himself. Christ, Savior, Messiah, Rescuer, and King. And I want to talk about King for just a minute. King. We haven't talked much about the Magi yet all uh, month. And if you've seen in the two or three of the videos tonight, uh, we looked at the Magi and, and what they said. And there's lots of assumptions about the Magi. Lots of assumptions. A lot of it, again, comes from the Christmas carols we sing. We have no idea how many there were. There may have been three. There may have been 40. We don't know any of that. They certainly were not kings. And, um, you know, even in our manger scenes and in our pictures, they're always dressed in, in their whole regalia and they're coming in an entourage and pomp and circumstance. Probably not. The word magi, which is used here, uh, in, the, in the Greek is um, magus is the word. And it, it actually is an ancient Babylonian word that's a title given for the people in their community that are the advisors, counselors, teachers, professors, priests, doctors, seers and soothsayers, and astrologers. All of those are called magi. These guys could be any of those, or all of those. You know, uh, there, there may be just as likely poor university professors as uh, coming with all the regalia and pomp and circumstance. We don't know any of that. So what do we know? In Matthew chapter 2, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. And about that time, some wise men, that's Magi, from the east, uh, arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. We know they came to Herod. Herod was the king. His, he was part of the Roman government. And his actual literal title was king of the Jews. He had been given that title when he was placed there in Jerusalem by the Roman government. And so they went there, and that's logical. They're looking for the newborn king. They went to see the king. We also know here that they saw this star. They knew the cosmic importance of that. That doesn't mean they were astrologers, but it, knows, it means that they do have an awareness of that, and they knew the importance of this. And King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. And he called a meeting of the leading priests and religious leaders and said, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said. That's what the prophets wrote. And Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men and learned from them the time that the star appeared. And he said, 
go to Bethlehem, search carefully. When you find him, come back and tell me so I can go and worship too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and, and the star they had been east, that they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. And it went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You've probably all heard this before. I'm not saying anything new, and I've probably talked about this before too, but gold, frankincense, and myrrh are all uh, extremely valuable, expensive items. They all have multiple uses. And interesting, this week I found on the Smithsonian Museum website talks about these three things and says all three of them are necessary aspects for the coronation of a new king. Isn't that interesting? Well, let's look at them really quickly. Gold. We don't need to talk a lot about gold. We're aware of that. It's the easiest one. It's most familiar. Like today, gold was worn as jewelry. Uh, gold came in different levels of purity. Gold was plated on ornaments and on utensils, same as today. But as far back as, as ancient Egypt, thousands of years before Jesus, gold was a major deal in the tombs of the pharaohs. And most significantly, gold was, in this culture, the expected gift if you were going to go and meet with the king. If you got the opportunity to have a face-to-face -face with the king, you were expected to bring a gift of gold. It was symbolic gesture of royalty, of surrender, of authority, and of kingship. Gold was an expected gift for a king. What about frankincense? Most of us don't know a whole lot about frankincense. It actually comes from a tree. They would cut a tree and the sap would pour out. And as it poured out, they would leave it. It would harden right on the tree and then they would break it off. And it smelled. It smells quite a bit. It's got a strong smell. And it's used for all kinds of things. In medicine, it's good for um, bladder and bowel and colon issues. Believe it or not, frankincense was one of the most common things they used for flatulence control. I know a few who could probably use some. It was, it was used as a painkiller. It was often an ingredient in toothpaste. Now think about that. Toothpaste and flatulence control. It, there was lots of weird superstitions in North Africa. It was used to ward poisonous snakes away. But primarily, in every culture around the world at this time, it was bor burned as incense in worship of God. It was a gift of sweet perfume for God himself, an intentional act of worship. So gold was a gift for a king. Frankincense was a gift for God. And myrrh, actually both frankincense and myrrh have similar uses in the Old Testament. They're both burned as incense in the Old Testament temple. But myrrh is another smelly resin that comes from tree sap, and it also has a whole bunch of uses in medicine, in antiseptics, in painkillers, even insect repellent. Uh, even today, myrrh is used and mixed in remedies for ulcers and blood clots and asthma and arthritis and cancer and hemorrhoids. And it's a key ingredient in the Middle East in facial creams and masks. In the Bible, it was used in Exodus as a core ingredient in, in anointing oil and in the purification rituals for new kings and queens. None of that, though, is, is the most common use. The most common use from the time of, of ancient Egypt, it was, been in, it was used in embalming mummies. The primary purpose around the world in those days was to place it in a tomb to overcome the smell of the decaying body. Nice, eh? Use it for hemorrhoids, embalming, and facial cream. In Matthew chapter 2, we read, myrrh was brought to Jesus as an infant. In Mark chapter 15, myrrh was used as Jesus was dying. And in John chapter 19, Nicodemus and Joseph of, Joseph of Arimathea bought hundreds of pounds of mixture of myrrh and aloes to wrap Jesus' body with. Myrrh was a gift for a dead man. Strange gifts for a kid. 
a gift for a king, a gift for a god, and a gift for a dead man. Funny gifts to bring a child unless you know exactly who he is. I believe the wise men did not pack gifts randomly or just open and give whatever they had. I think they knew exactly where they were going, who they were meeting, what they were doing, and they packed appropriately. If they knew exactly who he was and if he is who he claims to be, then we don't just celebrate the birth of a famous historic figure. Christmas isn't just a nice family Santa celebration. It is the fulcrum of all of history. We celebrate the dawning of a new era, a page turn of history, and we are all invited in. Over the last four weeks, as I says, I said, we lit the candles. We lit the first candle saying that Jesus is the hope of the world. And we lit the second candle saying that Jesus is the ultimate gift of love. And we lit the third candle saying that Jesus was the source of of peace in our broken world. And the candle of joy, saying Jesus is where the joy is. Today, we put all four of those together and we light the final candle, the candle that stands for Christ. Christ as Savior and Lord, Messiah and King. Do you know every year on the Christmas carols, all of the Christmas carols call for some action. They all call for action. And here's some of those words. Um, Come, let us adore him. Listen to the the angel messengers. Let earth receive their king. Let every heart prepare him room. Go tell it on the mountain. Why? Because the hopes and fears of all the years are met in him tonight. And so we sang already, probably the most appropriate words in all of it is just simply fall on your knees. Why? Because on a silent night, on a holy night, it was the dawn of redeeming grace. Now what we're going to do is all of you have a candle. And I am going to light my candle from the Christ candle here. And it's interesting how one little light, one little candle lights up a whole room. And I'm going to take this candle and I'm going to ask if you are on the end of one of the rows at the front, if you want to grab your candle and bring it up and light it from mine. Go back to your row and light the next one and then light the ones behind you. And as we sing this song, let's light all our candles and sing it together pray together. Father in heaven, as we've talked about tonight, Jesus is the hope. Jesus is love and peace and joy. Jesus, these are who you are. They're your character. As we celebrate today, tomorrow, may we come to full realization and experience your fullness in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.